Ah, the days go on, the week goes on. Here it is Wednesday, and you know what that means. Energy, the state of energy. Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And we have a special show today, me and my co-host, John Cole. Hi, John. Hey, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> and we set the show up with McKenna Kaufman. She's from You Hero, which uh, we're going to ask her to define that in a minute. But I'm going to tell you now, she's a co-director of the Energy Policy and Planning Group at U Hero at UH Manoa. Thank you for coming on the show, McKenna. Thanks for having me. Yeah. U Hero is the University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization. Yeah, so what is it? It is um, researchers who are really interested in policy analysis. So we, uh, it is uh, within the so Social Science Research Institute, and it sort of attracts research fellows from throughout the College of Social Sciences, people who really want to work on policy, economic policy. You know, it sounds like, you know, to me, the university is like divided up in two parts. You know, maybe that's too simplistic, but one part is the part that folds in on itself, you know, that you never hear about. It's behind the ivy tower, you know, up there in Manoa. <laughs> and the other part that's dedicated to helping the community that comes out. And if I had to make a wild guess, I would guess that you hero is part of the part that comes out. Am I right? Well, I'm not sure about the two-part analysis, but I definitely <laughs> think that you hero is, if, if that analysis is correct, then you hero is part of the part that comes out. Okay, right. <laughs> yeah. So what do you do for the community? Um, well, uh, basically we do economic research looking at how do we get to our clean energy transition, what are the trade-offs involved, and what are the best choices we can make, right? This is hard. Yes. <laughs> this is hard. God, you know, I hope they pay you really well for that. Mm. Never mind. <laughs> so give us an example of the kind of problem, the kind of research, the kind of analysis that you do in the, in the planning and policy group. Well, one of the things I wanted to point out is sort of this long relationship between UHERO and the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, John's um, organization, HNEI. I think oh, many years ago we sort of sat down and said we really need to marry the engineering side of things with the, um, the economics and policy and make sure we're talking to one another in order to understand what some of these trade-offs might be. So in 2009, we sort of kicked off this collaborative relationship where we've been developing models that talk to each other. So engineering models talking to economic models, and we've been able to sort of build capacity to answer some of the state's questions. Mm. Um, so some of the things we've looked at are you know, what are the uh, economic and greenhouse gas, we also have some environmental components in there, so greenhouse gas emissions are measured as well. So what are the economic and greenhouse gas impacts of, say, laying an undersea cable and building a large wind project, which is something that the governor has recently sort of resurrected as an idea, um, as well as um, what would be sort of the economic impacts of bringing in uh, liquefied natural gas for the power sector. What are the greenhouse gas implications of that? He hasn't resurrected that one just yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but these are the kinds of you know analyses we try to get out there into the public domain. Um, so to answer your question, what do we do? We put it all on our website. We make it all very publicly available. Try to uh, write briefs in you know very plain language that people can really get their hands around. Um, in order to understand if we do this, what are some of the implications, mm -hmm. right? Well, what's your website? Uh, Uhero.hawaii.edu, and then you can go to the link that's Energy Policy and Planning Group, and all of our working papers are there. So the working paper is research result. Mm -hmm. Does it have conclusions and recommendations, too? Yes. Ooh, this is really important for government. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, a university can you do huge benefit by making affirmative rep recommendations one way or the other. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes people don't do that because they you know they're stepping on their toes and all. But but if you do that, if you make recommendations, then you're really making a gift, you know, to the rest of us. So HNEI, how does HNEI get married, you know, to you <laughs> hero? How does that work? Do they come and ask you questions, or do you come and tell them what their analysis should be? How does that work? Well, HNEI has been doing electric system modeling for quite a while now. Um, basically looking at the electric system and if you make certain changes to it, you know, what are the implications on the technology side, how will the system behave, and what are, you know, some of the high-level costs of making those changes and the benefits that might accrue from, you know, making those costs, whether it's having more renewables on the system <coughs> and how you can make the system stable doing that. Um, but the, we come up with 
pricing, or not, not pricing as in how much people pay for electricity, but how much it costs the utility r to run their system under different scenarios. And we can kind of come up with, you know, um, benchmarks that will say, you know, if, if, if a mitigation can beat this cost, then it will be worth putting in. But we've never, we, those models don't have uh, deep economic analyses. And I think McKenna's group can use a lot of the data that we use in those models as far as how the system runs and how, you know, dispatch of things change and what those costs are and go a lot deeper and look at some of the implications of those, you know, cost changes and yeah. how they affect you want this? the energy system, the customers, and even the statewide economy. It's like feedback. It's yeah. like you're, you're testing your system against the economic analysis to make sure you're not flying off into space with high science. Right. It's, it's yeah. another piece. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're looking mostly at the technical side and some high-level cost stuff, and they bring it further, you know, down the economics line yeah. to be able to look at customer impacts and actual costs so and statewide you've impacts. It, McKenna, you've heard it from John. <laughs> How much of what John has said do, do you agree with? Um, given we're working on this together, 100 percent, right? So um, I'd be a actually, little scared at 110 percent. Right. <laughs> One of the things we're working on now, um, as John said, is you know working with the really, really detailed production cost model. You know, I we're using the outputs of their production cost model, particularly different scenarios about curtailment of renewable energy. That means there's huge times mm -hmm. of the day that renewable energy is being discarded because we have flat rate pricing, right? So right now there's no incentive for consumers to respond to you know, times of the day when renewable energy may be more plentiful than others, right? So one of the things we're looking at is taking their estimates of what are the times of the day that renewable energy is currently being discarded, what happens if we um, went with some you know, radically different pricing mechanisms, something more akin to real-time pricing or dynamic pricing, um, how might consumers respond, what's the opportunity for load shifting as a result of that? And so uh, then we're able, in theory, we're going to be able to, because it's something we're working on right now, <laughs> feed that back into the protection cost model and see, well, then how would that change it's generation? Iterative. It's iterative. Right. You're yeah. going to tell them, thanks for that system, but, you know, we looked at it, and maybe you should tweak the system, because then the result, when we make our iterative analysis, will be better. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then in the end, the hope is that we, move, we say, okay, if this is, you know, what we think is an idealized pathway to, or, you know, a couple of pathways <laughs> to get to um, our renewable portfolio standard goals, then we can take that and say, okay, what's the economic impact of that, right? What do we think that's going to do in terms of changing, you know, electricity prices? How does that affect the economy? Um, the changing sort of shift away from fossil fuels and towards, you know, solar uptake and wind energy uptake. How does that affect the economy? So it sounds like there's two parts to what you do. I, I think I'm getting... One part is you're going to look at the pricing, see if it works. Mm -hmm. Two is you're going to look at, look at that, the whole ball of wax, and see how it affects other things in the economy, the economy in general. Absolutely. Which we really need to know from you about that. Because mm -hmm. you know? everything, you know. But <clears throat> what is the ideal you're, you're, you're seeking? A better economy? A stable economy? An economy with more this or more that or less this or less that? What, what, is, what is your ideal economy that you're working toward? Well, okay, so I think that's a really good question and probably one for sort of the bigger policy question of what is, what's the motivation behind the RPS laws, right? And probably there's multiple motivations. So um, in the law itself is written that, you know, it has to be cost effective. Right. So, what does that mean? So, part yeah, right. so part of our job is to help interpret multiple things that that could mean. Right. Cost of effective against what baseline? Cost of effective against um, other greenhouse gas mitigation strategies, assuming that greenhouse gas mitigation is also um, a driver of this. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, in if I were to dis define what this means for everybody, I'd say it's how do we reduce greenhouse gas emissions at least cost? Okay. Um, um, I heard something recently I'd like to throw out at you. Um, reducing emissions here in Hawaii um, as a function of how the world is going to deal with climate change, zero effect. It's so infinitesimal that it really doesn't mean anything. So you're putting a value judgment on it, really, is what you're doing. Is we want to do the right thing. So my question, I always wanted to ask an, econ an economist this question, <laughs> How much is the right thing worth in American dollars? Well, okay, backing up a little bit. 
the so there is definitely a value judgment right but there's a value judgment in any policy that's put forward right we say the rps law should be put forward that has sort of lots of value judgment in it right so why we do it you know matters um in terms of greenhouse gas emission reduction specifically as one of the motivating factors, right, besides being cost reduction factors, um, I think that, yes, that's absolutely a value judgment we, th we should do it. In terms of Hawaii's contribution, Hawaii is a really small state, so yes, it's small, but our per capita emissions are just like everybody else in the U.S., right? So on a per capita basis, we have sort of the same you know, moral imperative that the rest of the country does. And if every small state said we're not going to do anything, well, that's a pretty quick way to do nothing, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, in terms of emissions compared to other countries, in Hawaii we're, you know, orders of magnitude larger. So we're, our, our emissions are about similar to the U.S. average. Mm -hmm. um, what about the economy in general in terms of um, helping people live better lives? helping people who are unemployed become employed, helping people who have jobs make more money in their jobs, helping people who pay too much for this or that or the other thing pay less. I mean, are you interested in that, that let look at the economy? Absolutely, right? That's the portion about driving down electricity rates, right? There's lots of research in Hawaii and across the world saying that high electricity rates, high energy costs really can cripple an economy. Right, so if um, you or, want... Or uh, on, the, on the, uh, the flip side of that, is an economy with ample, uh, cheap energy is going to be a better economy? I mean, I'm sure that's part of all the principles of economics these days. Right, absolutely. And it's, it's an interesting thing, actually, because, you know, if you look at our electric sector, it's really small as a, as a relative portion of the overall economy. I think it's roughly 2% of the overall economy. But compared to other sectors of the same magnitude, it's far more important because it goes into everything. Right, so because it has this sort of aggregate impact across the economy, it ends up being a much larger sector than it is just sort of sure. in value. Sure, it's a leverage terms. thing, right? More than most other things. Well, John, you've been listening to McKenna, and uh, <laughs> I just wondered uh, how much of what she has been saying you agree with. Oh, all of it, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that I, neat hundred percent part. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm definitely no expert on macroeconomics and you know statewide impacts of things, so. That's why I think the relationship we have is so important. So the relationship, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, too, it's an iterative relationship. However, mm -hmm. you know, you're the, mm, you're the data. You're the, you're the system. Uh, right. you're, you're actually feeding the economist, McKenna, data. And she is saying, well, you know, let's fix that and tune that. And let me ask you some questions about the data so I really understand what's happening. Right. Um, so it's, it's um, I don't, don't want to make it hard, uh, vertical, but you're, you're providing data up to her. She's doing policy on your data, in effect. Yeah, I mean, she's running her analyses on a, a lot of its data that we help mm -hmm. provide or get for her through, you know, our modeling and relationship with the utilities and stuff. But I, like she's taking it a step further than we do. We're looking at the system itself and the costs within the system and how those might fluctuate. And she's taking it and going a step further. Like for instance, she was talking about pricing and how it can affect cu customers' behavior. If she tells us that you know a certain pricing scheme might change behavior and make the load look different during the day, then we can go back and put that into our model and see what effects that has on the system itself and how it might change how we oh. mitigate or get more renewables on or, or other things about the system that, you know, will en end up with us putting out different results. And again, like you said, it's an iterative process. We yeah. can go back and forth and kind of fine tune things. These uh, shows also are iterative. What I mean <laughs> is every 14 minutes we take a break. That's iteration. <laughs> We're going to take one now. Watch this. Boop. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, offering lifelong learning from passionate hosts and fascinating guests ready to explore and explain Hawaii's place in the 21st century. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, ThinkTechHawaii.com. I appear on Mondays at 3 o'clock, and my gig is energy efficiency, doing more with less. It's the most cost effective way that we in Hawaii are going to achieve 100% clean energy by the year 2045. I look forward to being with you. Aloha. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. 
I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. I love that kid. Who is that kid? <laughs> Never mind. We have McKenna Kaufman here from You Hero. She's the um, co-director of the Energy Policy and Planning Group there at You Hero. And we have John Cole. John Cole, former uh, commissioner of the PUC and now a principal of uh, HNEI, White Natural Energy Institute, doing valuable things. And these guys, somewhere along the line, figured out if they got together and uh, did iterative planning between HNEI and New Hero, we'd have, we'd have a, a better look, especially at things like, uh, what is it, uh, t time, of, time of use charges on electricity. Wow, this is really big because everybody's on board for it, you know what I mean? They People, are. Oh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> well, knock wood, yeah, knock wood. <laughs> Assuming they are, you know, if we're ready as a group, as a community to do this, this is going to be huge, and you're mm -hmm. right in the middle of it. But how do you figure out how you're going to incentivize, push, pull, de-incentivize, whatever you have to do in order to get the desired result? I mean, this is the part of economics that's completely subjective. How do you handle that? Um, so. On our website, we actually have a study that looks at what do we think would be the sort of order of magnitude effects of adopting um, what was at the time the utilities proposed time of use rates. And it's since sort of the docket has since been ruled on and the utility has been um, given the go ahead to actually implement the program, right? So the idea is it's going to be a voluntary program to start where your rates are going to vary throughout the day. What was um, put forth is sort of having three time buckets. One that covers most of the work day and high sun hours, one that's your peak, right? And the idea is that you really want to shave that peak from residential load because that's when you have really costly generation, right? Um, and then throughout the night. And the pricing over the peak is very expensive. Um, and in the middle of the day and in the nighttime, the, it's much cheaper. It varies by island, varies by electricity system. Oh, yeah. So, so when you shake it and bake it, though, you're, mm -hmm. you're going to provide the pricing that is necessary to shave those peaks, to, to make a flat line out of it, yeah? Well, so this was what the, the utilities proposal and what they're sort of, you know, have to move on is, is to shave the peaks as well as um, basically trying to do a better job at matching um, the supply of renewable energy, right? So if you think about solar, that's in the high sun hours, 10 to 5-ish. Um, wind is more co consistent throughout the day. Um, but trying to match those times of so day. So you know what you want. You know the curve you want to get. Roughly. It's and a you, little bit... And you, and you know that if you, <laughs> if you raise the price of energy at a given time, uh, you're going to, according to the human, the human condition, <laughs> then people will use less of it. Right. And if you reduce the price of energy, then hopefully people will do the ver reverse and use more of it. So how much less and how much more, and how do you find out? Is there a, a magic box you know, <laughs> that you talk to? We made a magic box. <laughs> <laughs> we, what we did was we, we looked at what happened in other places when they launched, launched these programs. So we took sort of our best estimates from what happened in other places and figured out which ones, you know, applied to Hawaii situations, which ones didn't, and used those estimates to give a proxy for, um, for what we think could happen here. This is social engineering. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> You're taking certain factors from a place that you think is comparable. Right. And you're hoping by your analysis that when you think it's comparable, it really is comparable. Yes. You know? So ex post analysis is critical too. <laughs> um, so what we, you know, basically what, at the end of the day, time of use rates in terms of this block pricing is, le is a stepping stone. There's a couple stepping stones, right? From an economics perspective, you know, what would constitute real efficiency would be something akin to real time pricing. Because, you know, even though the sun, you know, has high sun hours, really clouds roll over these things, you know. So what you would really want is real time pricing where you'd be sending those price signals instantaneously or close to instantaneously. But that's, I think, you know, we have to take a few steps before we can get there. So this time of use uh, block rate structure is one of those steps. That's so interesting, though. That, can we dwell on that for a minute, just for a minute? You know, so the cloud comes over. You want to hold your flat line. 
you, you don't want that cloud to affect, you know, to, to change the curve. Mm -hmm. You want people to react immediately. So I can just see a guy walking down the street and his cell phone beeps at him. And it says, you know, special sale <laughs> on electricity. You can buy it now. And he goes to the other app on his cell phone and he says, turn all, turn my appliances on. I got a special sale on electricity, turn them all on. And that sends a message to his house. And now his house has got all the apps running, doing the laundry automatically, whatnot. Is this doable, John? Is this doable? Ideally, yes. And ideally, you would even cut out the app and the phone and it would happen automatically. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> sign up for that. <laughs> yeah, Special right. Program. There's going to be people trying to sell those kinds of products one day. Yeah. But uh, that, that would be the most efficient. Yeah, those products are in <laughs> development right now. Yeah. This Definitely. what I just described? Yeah, Ooh. absolutely. <laughs> Ooh. So, I mean, it's you know, a few years off, but that's yeah. a, it's definitely in the works, right? So that's why I think time of use rates are that sort of stepping stone is because time of use rates give people some certainty, right? It's not, <laughs> there's, not less, there's less uncertainty. Just, let, me, let me go back to my, my, my mm -hmm. double app thing, okay? And as John suggests, let me put the two apps together. Now it's automated. Neither of them is actually on my phone. They all live in, in some computer somewhere, in the cloud, if you will. Okay, and it's going to say, well, we, we, need a, we need to have more people buying, doing their laundry right now, so we're going to have more laundry done. We're going to, we're going to make more laundry happen right now. <laughs> and, and I have signed up for that. I have checked the box and signed my name, and I want this, and you know, I, I don't want discretion on it. I just want it to happen. But if everybody does that, you're not doing any more social engineering. <laughs> you're, you're, the okay machine is doing it. Do we still need you, McKenna? I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We, <laughs> we got down to the bedrock of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that means all the solutions have been solved. If the problems have been solved. There's all these solutions. But isn't that the logical <laughs> conclusion of your work together? That when, when you find out what these principles are, then you supplant the machine for you know the the human <laughs> the human foible. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I mean, so getting away from the machine issue. <laughs> <but, laughs> um, really, sort of thinking about what is that interaction between available technologies, future technologies, and how people are going to react to them, and what are the incentive structures um, to help that or not, right, yeah. is really where this is all sitting, right? So right now we're, we have a set of constraints about technology and what, what we think could happen. What do you mean by that, what constraints? I mean, sort of, you know, if you think battery technology costs, oh, right? Okay. They're, yeah. they're coming down really rapidly, but it's yeah. still, you know, on the expensive side. Um, and then the constraints aren't just technology, it's also, you know, the social and physical constraints. You know, who has the space to install batteries in their garages, right? Who has the space and the autonomy to do that? So that's huge, right? It's a moving target. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, your, your assumptions are, has to be constantly changing. You write a paper this week, next week there's something that changes it. You know? Or, or something happens in the science that changes it. Yep, definitely. And I mean, another thing is the system needs to keep up with all these things we're talking about. It's been a little slow in that regard. So, I mean, that's part of the problems we're facing now. What do you mean now. by that? What do you mean? I mean, the, the electric system and how it can handle the changes. I mean, it was built to work a certain way, and now things are changing so much. I mean, traditionally, it's been they make they generate the electricity to meet people's use of it, to the demand whenever they want to use it. And now it's kind of flipping, whereas we're trying to make the use of energy fit the supply more, you know, when it's being produced, like well, we'll solar, for instance. Here. Is this helpful to make our listeners understand <laughs> what you work with? Why don't you describe it? <laughs> yes, okay, so these are slides to describe it. We didn't actually call them up when we were talking about it. Um, so this is kind of a, a, just a, a slide that sort of describes we use um, HNEI's work in production cost models, and we feed that to our um, electricity demand model. And we're able to then estimate load shifting potential, right? Um, and then we sort of feed that back, this iterative process back to HNEI. Um, and then ultimately, when we've iterated enough and we think we have um, some, some reasonable scenarios, then we'll put it up to our economy-wide model, which is called HCGE. Um, and which will, then we can study the economic impacts of these really high-level renewable energy. My systems. reaction is this is great. This is this is some, uh, you're going to you're going to be busy doing this for your whole career, and you're going to be better <laughs> and better. But uh, two two time 
factor questions I want to put to you guys. Why didn't this happen before? What was holding us back from the marriage you're talking about, and this kind of um, iterative analysis that we can do now, are doing now? Why didn't we do this five years ago? What was holding us back? We've actually been doing it for about seven years. Right, so maybe uh, well, that's, that <laughs> completely destroys my question, but that's okay. But maybe it's a matter we we need to get the word out. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, I have to come right? on the show more often. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> okay. Next question, and this this is another time factor question. So right now you've described a pretty sophisticated way of looking at things, and a way, in my view, that comports with you know all the all the, the, you know, the, 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 the whirling dervish items, you know, that are in, in, in motion mm -hmm. in, in energy. Um, and so it's hard, you know, it's hard to think that that's going to stay still. It's not going to stay still. Uh, so where is this all going to go in terms of, you know, the, the per perception of the systems, the development design of the systems, and then the, the process you have working between the two of you uh, to achieve the, the optimal result? Where do you see your relationship going you know in the future next five years and don't tell me you've already done that <laughs> john <laughs> we haven't done the future yet but like, like mckenna said just continuing this process to try to look at the best way to you know run the system in getting to the policy goals that we want to meet and that's both on the technical side and the economic side so i think the relationship is important to have the feedback between them what are your constraints now? I mean, if, if make me king, and I, I say to you, what do you need? I'll give you anything you want in order to develop this science and this kind of analysis to the best it can possibly be. What constrains you? What can I do to make it easy for you? Money? Wow. You want money? <laughs> Just ask. Well, some of it's the cost of the technologies that are needed to go the way we want to go. Like McKenna mentioned, battery costs. We know it works, but it's expensive right now, and we're not real sure about the life or how long it lasts and how often you're going to have to replace batteries, for instance. You told her about graphene. things like that. You told her about graphene. <laughs> oh, I've heard about that. But you know about graphene. I don't have that. It, New kinds it, of batteries it, coming down the pike. It, if that comes yeah. down the pike, it might yeah. solve all our problems. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, those, those types of things that we don't really have control over and we don't quite know how it's going to shake out yet but we see trends so I mean we, we kind of that's what we're looking at to yeah. try to figure out where to go yeah we all have to look at we all have to stay informed and you have to keep coming back to think tech <laughs> but let me add, uh, offer you you wanted to know before what light to look at it's that red light over there McKenna <laughs> and I'm offering you the opportunity to close now and tell them whatever you want them to take away uh, from this discussion <laughs> what would you tell them to take away from this discussion? Um, so there's some great research going on at the university. <laughs> and I think one of the things that John and I wanted to get across today is, you know, we've been really working on thinking about how the engineering side and the economics and policy work together. But also what I think is so important in this building off what John just said is, you know, we really don't have any kind of crystal ball. Like, all we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to build an understanding of what are the trade-offs with what we know and what we can reasonably expect, right? So that's why I think we do a lot of scenario analysis, right? If it's this pathway or this pathway or this pathway, then these are the decisions you need to make now and these are the trade-offs in the future. Um, and so if we can give insights into that for decision-making, that's our, our goal. This makes economics more interesting than you ever thought it would be. <laughs> no kidding, this is terrific what you guys are doing. John, you wanna close, say bye. Well, thanks a lot for having me again, Jay, and uh, maybe we'll see you again next week. Okay, <laughs> maybe we will. Thank you, McKenna. Thank you for having me. Bye -bye.